Hi, my name is Julia, and I'm the lead interpreter here at the Newcastle Courthouse Museum, which is part of the Delaware Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs. I have a presentation for you today called Letter of the Law. I will happily answer any questions via email on my last slide. I will have my email so you can send questions there. But before we begin, I would like to briefly tell you a little bit more about the Delaware Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs, also known as HCA. HCA is a state agency which manages five museums in Delaware. At the museums, we offer guided tours, educational programming, special events, and more. All museums have free admission. HCA houses the state collection, which includes material culture such as portraits and furniture. HCA also maintains the state archaeological collections. The Delaware State Historic Preservation Office is housed within our division. The Preservation Office administers the National Register of Historic Places program. The Preservation Office also manages Delaware's Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program, which assists in preserving and rehabilitating historic buildings throughout Delaware. Those of us who work at HCA are passionate about HCA's goals to collect, preserve, and talk about Delaware's history. I would like to take a moment to recognize that we will be discussing the unequal treatment certain groups have in the criminal justice system and that the material from this program may be difficult to hear. If you at any point need space, you're more than welcome to stop and step away and come back at a later time. We will be talking about historical laws and they use the language of their time. This means you will hear the words Negroes, mulattoes, and black persons used in their historical context. We understand that these words may be uncomfortable and we do not condone their uses, usage, but we wish to accurately portray the laws that work to marginalize certain groups. Have you ever experienced a situation where you thought the rules were unfair? I know as a younger sibling, my older sisters thought the rules were applied unevenly among us. It can be frustrating when the rules are not applied evenly. Ideally, the law should treat everyone equally, but that doesn't always happen. We like to think of laws as this impartial thing above the whims of society and these peoples, but... The law is created by people in a society that are imperfect. Therefore, the law is imperfect and through its writing and enforcement can treat various groups differently. Throughout history, various groups have been treated differently by the law for a multiple of re multitude of reasons. Today, we are going to focus on people of color and specifically the African-American community from around the American Revolution to the Reconstruction period, so the late 1700s to 1875. Laws are not created in a vacuum. They are created by humans affected by the events in the wider world and their own bias, whether implicit or explicit. During the late 1700s to 1875, those who created laws were not representative of those affected by the law. Laws lots of times are inherently reactionary. They are reactions to events, societal norms, or people's actions. This means that whether intentionally or unintentionally, that the law can treat those of separate groups differently. The law itself can be written in a way that treats people of a certain group differently. This treatment can be intentional or unintentional. It can also be through absence in the law. While a group could have certain actions regulated by the law, they could also not be afforded certain protections by the law if they weren't written in. It can also be present in the way the law is enforced. Laws could be applied to certain groups differently than others, making it inequitable. When looking at laws, you may want to ask yourself some questions. Who and what is the law about? Who is or is not mentioned in the law and why that might matter? How does this law affect the people mentioned in it? How is this law enforced? Who makes the laws? Why is it a law? If you ask these certain questions, you can begin to put together the unique circumstances that come together to create this law. 
You can also investigate who specifically created these laws and who voted for or advocated for these laws. You can dig into why the people would want this law to be a law and who would benefit or not from it. And these laws can these can give us insight into the creation of these laws. It was the law that created the stratification inherent in race-based slavery. As the American colonists became more reliant on free labor, it became economically advantageous for there to be a steady source of free labor. Most white people in servitude were indentured servants whose terms of servitude were limited to a set amount of time and whose humanity was still recognized. In the late 1600s, laws were created that established race-based slavery. More specifically, laws were created that ensured a child's status as free or enslaved was hereditary, determined by the status of the mother. If the mother was free at the time of the child's birth, the child was born free. If the mother was enslaved, the child was enslaved. This enslavement had no limit and could be passed down indefinitely from mother to child. Racially explicit laws continued to be passed, including slave codes, which were laws that greatly restricted the rights of people of color in the new colonies. They mostly controlled their movements and their access to economic opportunities. This was a motion to control the population to make it easier to keep them in enslavement. This codification of the system of race-based enslavement is seen in the creation of these laws restricting the rights of certain groups of people. To get a better idea of where this started, we need to look at the Dutch and the Swedes. In 1639, an African man by the name of Anthony Schwartz was brought over to the colony of New Sweden and was enslaved by one of the governors, Joseph Prince. Though little is known past these facts about the first person of African descent in the area that would later become Delaware. Enslavement really begins to show up in the legal code and not just in the common law with the English who took control of the area from the Dutch and the Swedes and in the laws and in the laws of the Duke of York in 1655. These laws stated that if an enslaved person converted to Christianity that did not mean that they were free as was tradition by English common law. It also comes up in this period about whether a person inherited their status from their mother or father. Court cases at this time and other documents point to it be part of common law that it was inherited from the mother. It is also in 1700 that Pennsylvania, which Delaware was a part of at the time, <clears throat> came out with a law solidifying the distinction between the races with creating a separate court for the <clears throat> uh, population of the people of color, free or otherwise. These were part of the first comprehensive slave code in Delaware and Pennsylvania. And even after Delaware gained its own legislature in 1704, its laws were usually similar to Pennsylvania's, the example being that the 1725 revision of Pennsylvania slave codes were mirrored in Delaware just a year later in 1726. This enshrining of enslavement in the law was not unique to Delaware. One of the nation's founding documents, the U.S. Constitution, explicitly allows uh, enslavement with the Three-Fifths Compromise, which states those that are enslaved counts as three-fifths of a person when counting the population for voting purposes. This tendency to expressly state racism in the laws to support a system of enslavement was nationwide and can not only be seen in national documents and laws, but on the state level as well. Delaware's constitutions are an example of this. The constitution of interest to us is the one created in 1776 prior to its revisions in 1792, 1831, and 1897. The 1776 Constitution states that the qualifications for voting is property ownership, which excludes many people from voting, including Delawareans of color. The 
Additionally, there were state laws preventing people of color from holding political positions. This also brings up the question of how equitable laws can be if not everyone was included in the creation of the laws. Who was included in the political discussion? Who is making the laws? If the people who do not know the experience of those who they are making laws for, can those laws effectively govern those people? What is particularly interesting about the 1776 Constitution is Article 26. Article 26 states, no person hereafter imported into the state from Africa ought to be held in slavery under any pretense whatsoever, and no Negro, Indian, or mulatto slave ought to be brought into the state for sale from any part of this world. This effectively banned the international slave trade in Delaware, but it left the interstate slave trade legal. Without any supporting legislation, the enforcement of this article was uneven at best. Dr. Charles Ridgely and Richard Bassett, pictured here, <clears throat> seem to have used some political maneuvering to make sure that this was part of the Constitution, as Delaware was fairly split on the idea of slavery. Ridgely and Bassett got this measure put in and passed while the opposition was away. The first Delaware law we are going to take a deep look at is an act for the trial of Negroes. This law discusses how two justices of the peace and six freeholders would hear and determine offenses done by enslaved people. This is very different than the trial by a jury of peers that is given to other people in Delaware. It also specifically mentions that if an enslaved person was convicted for a capital crime, that the enslaver was entitled to two-thirds of what that enslaved person was worth. This statement fully establishes an enslaved person as the property of the enslaver, since the enslaver is quote-unquote being deprived of their property, though they did not participate in any wrongdoing. This is further illustrated with another law called an act for the effectual preventing of the evil and wicked practices of horse stealing and other felonies and offenses committed within this government that lumped the stealing of a horse with the stealing of an enslaved person. The clear implication of these laws are that an enslaved person is no more human than a horse is. To further solidify the distinction between the races, there started to be laws that dealt with interracial relationships and mixed-race children. One law stated that illegitimate children of a white woman and <clears throat> a black father were to be enslaved until they were 31, but that punishment was later re repealed in 1795 as it was punishing the crime, the child for the crimes of the parent. There was no specification uh, for a child of a white man and a woman of color. A precedent starts to come around where a child takes their status from the mother, defining enslavement as matrilineal, regardless of the father. Later, there would be laws clarifying the status of mixed-race children. There were also laws that made interracial marriage illegal and punished those that performed them. One interesting fact about the solidifying of race-based hereditary enslavement is that Delaware did not have a legal definition of race. Race might have been explicitly stated in the law, but without a definition of who was white or who was black, it was arbitrary to determine what race a person belonged to. In the legal world, most things are made as clear as possible, so it's notable that this definition was neglected. Maryland, South Carolina, and Louisiana were other slave states that did not have a legal definition of race. Delaware's unique geographic position in the Mid-Atlantic on the border of what were considered free and enslaved states gave rise to a unique legal landscape when it comes to enslavement. This border state status would be cemented when Delaware kept the institution of slavery but did not secede from the Union during the Civil War. Delaware was committed to the institution of slavery, but as a small state, it knew it was safest to stick with the Union. This choice to keep enslavement but not leave the Union also affects Delaware 
after the Civil War. Since it did not rebel, it was not put under the same federal oversight that states that practiced enslavement, other states that practiced enslavement had. For example, the Emancipation Proclamation only applied to those rebelling against the Union, so Delaware wasn't subject to it. To add to this unique position, Delaware created laws preventing the exportation of enslaved people out of the state in 1787, 1789, and 1797. The 1787 law specifies the Carolinas, Georgia, and the West Indies as illegal to sell to. The 1789 law adds Maryland and Virginia to the list. In 1797, the law states that if someone was sold out of state illegally, they were automatically free, though this freedom was restricted. Those freed by these laws were only allowed the rights to hold property and seek legal redress if damage was done to themselves or the property that they held, <clears throat> and were expressly forbidden to vote hold elected position, or give evidence against a white person, as stated in the 1787 law. It also stated that in the law, while it was banned to sell someone out of state, you could get a permit or license to sell out of state. There is evidence of enslavers asking for this permit to bring enslaved people across state lines throughout the laws of Delaware. Without legal avenues to sell enslaved people out of state, some enslavers began to illegally kidnap free people of color. In 1793, the punishment for selling a free person into slavery in another state was 39 lashes, one hour in the pillory, and they would have the fleshy part of their ear cut off. These harsh measures seem to indicate a desire to arrest this action. It also pops up in the court record quite often, as those that were kidnapped tried to sue for freedom or restitution. In a case close to home, in 1816, a 15-year-old girl of color named Bathsheba Bungie was kidnapped and was taken to Maryland, and her case was heard here at the Newcastle Courthouse. The kidnappers were found guilty and were whipped put in the pillory for an hour and had the fleshy part of their ear nailed to the pillory and cut off at the end of the hour as stated in the law. Though it was not always the case that the kidnapper was found guilty. In April 1841 of State v. Griffin, they were found not guilty. These laws could offer some small protection to those already freed, but it was limited. Delaware's status as a border state, especially one attached to Pennsylvania, which gradually abolished enslavement in the 1780s, led to increased worry about the rising free population and those using the small state to make their way for self-emancipation. This, in turn, led to stricter laws meant to try to control the population. This new type of law is sometimes referred to as black codes and they greatly restricted the rights of people of color, even those no longer in enslavement. This restricted their freedom of movement, ability to possess firearms, vote, and serve on a jury. They also had to prove to be financially stable. The restriction of movement has its roots in the solidification of slavery. In 1739, a law called an Act for the Regulation of Servants and Slaves mentions that any suspicious persons traveling through Delaware that could not produce proper documentation is considered to be a runaway slave. It also describes penalties for people assisting someone self-emancipating with specific punishments designed for free persons of color. It also mentions that an enslaved person cannot live more than 10 miles away from their enslaver. A later law in 1826 states that an enslaver looking for someone self-emancipating can swear before the court that this their enslaved person and get assistance. All movement of free people of color into or out of the state of Delaware was halted through legislation in 1851 due, due to concerns that in increase in free persons of color was a great and growing evil, injurious and corrupting to the resident Negroes and mulattoes. In 1855, the law exempted sober and industrious 
uh, people of color from Maryland coming to labor in Delaware. In an 1863 law where if a free person of color left Delaware for more than just six days, they were considered non-residents and not allowed back into the state. There is also a law allowing enslaved people to work both sides of the state line without losing their enslaved status. This is direct opposition of the laws that greatly restricted the movement of free people of color across state lines, especially as the population grew. This is important to point out as the men in government would have economically benefited from their enslaved labor. Restrictions usually increased with certain events happening in the world, especially slave uprisings. The Haitian Revolution in the 1790s, which coincided with the height of the institution of slavery in Delaware, led to increasingly strict laws to prevent uprisings in the United States. The Nat Turner Rebellion was a slave uprising in Virginia in 1831, led by a traveling African-American preacher named Nat Turner. It was the deadliest slave revolt in U.S. history. In the fear after the Nat Turner Rebellion that there were rumors that predicted that Election Day of October 1831 would see uprisings from the enslaved population. In Seaford, on election day, a group of young white men pretended to be enslaved people engaging in an uprising. This scared the people of Seaford and beyond. The fear of true uprisings led to increased legislation to prevent those from happening. You can see the effect that this and the Nat Turner Rebellion had on Delaware through its laws. In early 1832, an act to prevent the use of firearms by free Negroes and free mulattoes for other purposes was passed. This law forbade ownership of quote-unquote warlike instruments, including guns by free persons of color. There also had been laws restricting the ownership of weapons by enslaved people and punishments for free black persons that just charged firearms in the common fines of a town, but not the furl restrictions of weapons for people of color. This law also restricts meetings of groups of more than 12 free black persons after 10 p.m. and had a section forbidding a black person from holding a meeting for religious worship without a license from a Delaware judge. These sections in the law seem to point in the direction that this law was created in direct response to the Nat Turner Rebellion. The laws also further restricted voting, forbidding both enslaved and free people of color from voting. In laws that freed those that were illegally sold across state lines, it explicitly states while they are free, they are not allowed to vote. There were also restrictions about free people of color being in the area during elections. A law in 1798 prevented free or enslaved black persons in a town where an election is happening unless there is a medical emergency. In 1849, a law allowed free persons of color to be sold into servitude for a year if it appeared that they did not have a job. They had 30 days after their term of servitude to find other honest work or be put into servitude for another year. If it was brought to the court's attention that persons of color could not support their children in the eyes of the justice of peace and trustees of the poor, the children could be taken into apprenticeships until 18 for females or age 12 for males. Also, the constable that brings these families to the attention of the court would be paid for each child bound out. The apprenticeships were supposed to teach children valuable skills for the workforce, but it is possible that this apprenticeship was used as a way to garner free labor. Warner Mifflin, along with other Quakers, in the 1790s assisted in making sure free children of color got proper indentures when their parents' poverty forced them to be put into an indenture. There is also mentions of friends of these parents that had to put their children into apprenticeships bill bidding for the child's apprenticeship, but in 1861, a law was passed saying that it was illegal to bind out free children of color to other free persons of color. This would seem to indicate that it was a common enough occurrence that it needed to be legislated. These actions tell us that these indentures and apprenticeships were something that their parents wished to avoid, or at least wanted some form of control over. <laughs>
1787, law, a law preventing the exportation of enslaved people, it stated while they were free, they could not give evidence against a white person. In 1799, it changed slightly that a free person of color could give testimony in a criminal case that did not have a white witness. In 1793, during State versus Bender, Phyllis Miller, a woman of color, was allowed to give her testimony. She was giving testimony for the indictment of Bender, a white man, as he was being indicted for the assault and battery on her. The judges determined that her testimony was valid as she was seeking redress and therefore should be able to give her testimony even though it was against a white man as it was part of seeking redress and an important part at that. In Delaware, there eventually became a precedent that a person was assumed free until proven otherwise. The first time this precedent is written out seems to be in State v. Dillahunt in 1840. To help us better understand the context of this case, we need to look at the population at the time. In 1840, there was about 2,600 enslaved people in Delaware and almost 17,000 free black persons recorded. So it is more than likely that someone would be free than enslaved at this time. During the case of State v. Dillahunt, the state called Charlotte Green. It was not confirmed whether Green was free or not, so her testimony was questioned, but the court decided to keep it. They mentioned that common law usually presumed a person free, which goes to prove that this was not the first time that there is a presumption of freedom. They also pointed out the large amount of the population that was free, so it was more likely for a person to be free than otherwise. The court took the fact that she acted as if she was free and presumed her free with no proof that she was or not. So, her testimony was accepted. Though, in subsequent cases, this presumption of freedom was constrained to being a witness and was not used for cases of kidnapping. One case held here in the Newcastle Courthouse also included this unique Delaware common law. In 1845, the Hawkins family lived in Angleside, Maryland. This is just an example. This is not the Hawkins family themselves. Sam Hawkins, the patriarch, was a free man, but his wife, Emmeline, was enslaved. And because a person's status uh, took their status from their mother, their children were also enslaved. Sam tried to buy his family's freedom, but was told no. They decided to take their chances on the Underground Railroad and were caught on their way out of abolitionist John's Hun's home in Middletown and were brought to the county seat, which was Newcastle at the time. While they were at the Newcastle courthouse, it was found that there was a discrepancy in their paperwork. This hang-up was used to call abolitionist Thomas Garrett from Wilmington. Garrett asked the family to come with him, and the Chief Justice of Delaware at the time, James Booth Jr., allowed them to go because, according to him, the law presumed that they were free until proven otherwise and chose to accept a copy of a Maryland manumission. The family eventually made their way to Bay Bear Township in Pennsylvania, where they settled. Thomas Garrett and John Hun were put on trial in 1848 in a federal trial presided over by Roger B. Tawney, who would later go on to write the Dred Scott decision and they were put on trial for breaking the 1793 Fugitive Slave Law Act. Both Hun and Garrett were heavily fined, but Garrett, at the end of the trial, announced his intention to keep assisting people on the Underground Railroad. Samuel Burris, a free man of color, assisted the family and was tried for a different incident on the Underground Railroad in 1847. His punishment as a free man of color was to be sold into servitude. But he ended up being bought by abolitionists in disguise, so averted being put into servitude. The difference in Garrett and Hun's punishments to Burris's shows a discrepancy in punishment between white persons and persons of color. Though this unique Delaware ruling of people being free until proven otherwise did assist the Hawkins family. Delaware did not allow people of color on the jury until after the 14th and 15th Amendments, but Neal v. Delaware was a case that straddled this line. The court heard the case of Neal v. Delaware in 1880, 
at the Newcastle Courthouse. This would be one of the final big criminal cases heard here at the Newcastle Courthouse before the courts moved up to Wilmington. William Neal, a man of color, was found guilty by an all-white jury. The 1831 Delaware Constitution stated specifically that white male citizens of the age of 22 years or upwards shall enjoy the right of an elector. And the 1849 statute stated that only those persons qualified to vote could serve as jurors. This excluded people of color being on the jury, and therefore it could be argued that William Neal did not have a jury of peers. Neal's lawyer, Anthony Higgins, appealed the court's decision as there were no jurors of color to even choose from, so Neal was not judged by a jury of peers. The Supreme Court heard this argument and Justice Harlan delivered the opinion that due to the 14th and 15th Amendments, that persons of color should not have been excluded from the jury selection due to the race, and that there would need to be a retrial. This retrial was held in Wilmington as the courts had moved up there and Neal was found not guilty with this new jury. The courts might have been unequal when they tried people, but they were also unequal in handing out punishments. In the early days of American courts, the punishments were more sanguine. The pillory, stocks, branding, and whipping were all common punishments. The old Newcastle prison that used to be behind the courthouse had a pillory and whipping post. Whipping was last used as a punishment in Delaware in 1952. The whipping as a punishment stayed on the book until the 1970s. <clears throat> According to Robert Caldwell in Red Hanna, 66% of people whipped between 1990 and 1940 were recorded as black persons. This is compared to the 26% that were recorded as white and the 8% where their race was unknown or not recorded. In 1889, Delaware finally abolished whipping as a punishment for all women after previously failing because women of all races were included. Whipping is indicative that at least certain punishments were being dealt out unequally among populations. Schooling was also unequal between certain populations due to the actions of the government. The General Assembly passed the School Law Act in 1829, which created the first Delaware free public school, but it was only for white children. There was no government-funded public education for children of color until 1875. The funds that were used um, were segregated, and this was unusual from other states. Taxes from the white population funded schools for white children, and the funds from people of color funded schools for children of color. This, of course, led to inequities in the school as funding sources were different for the schools. The schools for children of color, unfortunately, were underfunded and therefore not able to provide sufficient supplies or accommodation for the children. This could lead to unequal education due to the way the funding was legally prescribed. Some Delaware schools ended up being wrapped up in the later Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court case. Slavery was practiced in Delaware until the 13th Amendment. Since it never left the Union, it was not subject to the Emancipation Proclamation. When the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were sent to Delaware for ratification, Delaware declined to ratify them. It was not until 1901 that Delaware would ratify what were called the Reconstruction Amendments. This did not mean that these amendments did not have any power in Delaware as they were the law of the land, despite arguments by Delaware that it was the rights of the states to determine things stated in those amendments. And how they were followed was a different story. In Delaware at the time, the 15th Amendment... <clears throat> Uh, at the time of the 15th Amendment, voting was determined by the tax record or by paying a toll tax to a poll tax to vote. There were accounts of tax collectors mysteriously disappearing when a person of color came to pay their tax, therefore keeping them from voting. This was illegal under the Federal Enforcement Act, and Newcastle County electors were brought to U.S. District Court in 1872, where one of them, 
was convicted of not following the federal law. Delaware fought back with an assessment and collection law in 1873. The Assessment Act of 1873 allowed tax assessors and collectors not to be held liable if taxpayers found them unavailable to receive their taxes. Carol Hoffecker in Democracy in Delaware did mention she was not sure how effective this law was in its intention of discouraging people of color from voting, but it certainly made it much more difficult. This was not the only incidence of Delaware trying to push back against federal laws. The U.S. Congress created the Civil Rights Act of 1875 that was supposed to prevent discriminatory practices in public accommodation like railroads and hotels. I say supposed to because this law was very weakly enforced by the federal government and Delaware took advantage of this. Delaware created the Delaware Public Accommodation Act of 1875. This act did not directly mention race, but it did state that an owner of an establishment, including public accommodations, like those mentioned in the federal law, could refuse service to people that were, quote unquote, offensive to a major part of his customers. This seemed to be a way for people to refuse service to people of color, and it starts showing the change from explicitly stating the racism to hiding it behind different societal marks. This law was in effect until the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1963. As the effects of the Civil War and Reconstruction that followed it left its mark on the United States, states began to figure out what the world would look like now that the institution of slavery was gone. The Black Codes that popped up after the revolution to control free people of color in some places morphed into Jim Crow laws. A lot of these laws were in effect until the 1960s or later, so their effect can still be seen to this day in the inequities that exist in the justice system, whether through the creation of the law or through its enforcement. The society and the people that created these laws are imperfect, therefore the laws can be inequitable. But does that mean we stop looking for ways to make them more equitable, and how do we go about pushing them in that direction? I'd like to thank many people at HCA for helping make this program, and I would like to thank you for watching it. Up here is my email if you wish to send any questions, and have a good day.